Welcome adventurers new and old. You've probably arrived here after having seen the announcement for the next round of Adventurathon. If you haven't, please do go check that out. But if you've seen the announcement and you are here, that means that you're probably looking for some book recommendations. Hey everyone, how are you doing today? My name is Kirsty, aka Beth Bookish. I am the creator of the Adventurathon, which is very, very loosely inspired by D&D and other readathons that have come before it, such as Make Your Myth Taker and Medievalathon. Last year we were building characters, this year we've taken them on adventures. The first adventure we explored an island, we went on different quests, we earned some bounty gold, and then at the end we went through a portal where we have now found ourselves in the cursed village of Ashwood. We've now got to enter the house that is run by Lord Lucian Umbra and then eventually make our way into the bowels of hell itself to take him down. So, as I mentioned in the announcement, this is taking place over two different phases. Phase one is from the 1st to the 23rd of September where you'll be following set prompts and then in the final week anything goes. So even if you can't commit to the full readathon and do all of the prompts because maybe you've got other readathons, I'm aware of at least three other ones that are coming up this month that people are interested in. So, you know, if you are already very committed and don't want to overcommit, you can always just jump in on the final week where there are no reading prompts no books need to be recommended because it's completely based on what you want to read and it's all based on the pages you read, not what you read. So, you know, you can always save and join us in that final week. As I stated in the announcement, as you first arrive, you find yourself facing a small scenario and based on that scenario, you've got to read a sort of two-parter prompt. You can double this one up, you cannot double up any other prompt, but it's to read a book with a map inside and something on the cover that's determined whether you, based on where you end up. Now, I did say that a map inside I know is very fantasy, generally quite fantasy leaning towards, and people have commented that a lot of the prompts are too fantasy inclined. So, like I said in the announcement, I've tried this time around to make it so that, you know, the prompts can be applied no matter the genre. And so because I do know that a map in the book is very fantasy heavy and fantasy inclined, I have said that if you cannot find a book with a map that covers, that has the stuff on the cover, then it the alternative is to read a book set in the real world and it has to be a real place. So if the town that the book is set in is a made up place, that won't count. However, if that made up town is in a real place like say America or England, all's golden because you can just say, oh, it's set in England and that'll count. They're not that super strict. Please do just have fun with them. If you are new to the readathon and you didn't take part in any of the previous ones, just listen to what the prompts are and choose which of the starter four prompts you want to do. There's no, you don't have to do anything to like get ready for this one. So for prompt one, so location one, path one, whichever one you want to call it, this one was food and drink on the cover. I could have given a thousand recommendations of books that have food and drink on the cover, but I have tried to match them specifically to the either have a map inside or are set in our real world so I can give you examples. So food and drink on the cover with a map inside, if you wanted to go down that route, we have The Wolf and the Woodsman by Ava Reed. This Vicious Grace by Emily Teed, not as has not one but two maps inside and for ebooks we have Cursed Cocktails I don't know the author name so I'll put the cover up but Cursed Cocktails I have googled and it does have a map inside and honestly I struggled with this one that was pretty much all I got but thankfully we have absolutely tons of books that are set in the real world with food and drink on the cover we have Circe by Madeline Miller because we have she is holding a goblet so that counts. Before the Coffee Gets Cold by Toshikazu Karaguchi, which is set in Japan. Fake Dates and Mooncakes. Mooncakes is obviously the name of the food and they also are holding mooncakes. Cafe Con Lychee by Emery Lee is set in Vermont. Boyfriend Material by Alexis Hall is set in London, if I remember rightly. It's definitely set in England. Our Not So Lonely Planet Travel Guide. This one takes place in multiple countries. Our Dining Table by Mita Ori. You and Me on Vacation, I haven't yet read it so I don't know exactly where but I know that they do go on holiday. Oh it says New Orleans so it's got New Orleans on the back, so New Orleans. 
The Witches at the End of the World, this one. It hasn't got a specific country, but when I googled it, it did say that it's just set in, like, Scandinavia, and it is set in a real place, so... The Flat Share by Beth O'Leary is set in London, and there's also scenes in Brighton, I think it is, they go down to. Uh, now She Is Witch by Kirsty Logan is like, another one set in Scandinavia. Chef's Kiss, Eastside Hedwitch, Fruits Basket, Geekerella, Not In The Plan by Dana Hawkins, which is Seattle. One Last Stop by Casey McQuiston, which is New York. Role Playing by Kathy Yardley, that I can't remember. And The Authenticity Project by Claire Pooley, which I think is London, but has multiple countries. Next up we have Pathway 2 and this is to read a book that features your character's chosen weapon so like I said if they use daggers it would be dagger on the cover, if they use a greatsword it would be a greatsword etc. So this one can be as easy or as difficult as you choose. And I actually had a few with map because you know fantasy. If your character is an axe wielder then we have Among Thieves by MJ Kuhn. If they like the dagger 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 we have Fallen Kingdoms by Morgan Rhodes. This one has not only a map, it also has a glossary, a cast of characters, and so much helpful things. So we have a map. If your character is a poison wielder, because poison is a weapon, we have Poison Study by Maria V. Snyder. For Bow and Arrow, we have From Blood and Ash by Jennifer L. Armentrout. I don't have a physical copy of the book, but Google tells me there is a map in it. If they like firearms, we have Spy Family. It's a teeny tiny, very brief map, but on like page three, it has a very tiny little map of the area, so I count that. And Promise of Blood by Brian McClellan has a map right here. By far the biggest category for this is swords. So we have One Piece. I know it doesn't have a map inside, but what is the book about? Or certainly this first volume, what is it all about but getting a map to the Grand Line? Eh? Thinking outside the box. Gods of the Weirdwood by RJ Barker has a sword going through the middle. Gwen and Art are not in love by Let's Croucher. We have a little sword here in someone's hand. Conventionally Yours by Annabeth Albert, which is a contemporary real world one has a sword because someone is cosplaying and it has a really cool road map for the journey that they take through the book. We have Once and Future by Kieran Gillen which has you know King Arthur's sword. Fence by C.S. Picat has a fencing sword. Foil, don't yell at me. I don't know if this is a foil or a sabre, I just know it's it's a weapon and be glad that I know that it's called a foil or a sabre. And we have Sorcery of Thorns by Margaret Rogerson. And then for ones that don't have a map but are set in our world, again for Sword we have Darker by Four by Su Lin Tan. We have Mao by Rumiko Takahashi. If you're, your character might be a scythe user, therefore Horseman by Christina Henry. And again, they might be an axe user, so we have Sky in the Deep by Adrienne Young, which is a Vikings historical book. And then finally, another one for Firearms is Murder of Saints by Chris Miller, which he's holding a shotgun. So you have a whole vast array of weapons that your character can use. For Pathway 3, this is a book with fog, mist, smoke, anything kind of wispy on the cover. For map in the cover, we have Dark Rise by C.S. Picat. We've got all these kind of like wispy bits on his, Will's shoulder. Is it Will? I'm sure it's Will. Yep, on Will's shoulder. The Shadow of the Gods by John Gwynn. You can see here there is like a misty smoke coming out of the dragon's mouth, so it's his breath. Graceling by Kristen Kishore. Yes, it's got clouds in the background, but there is also this kind of like misty, wispy stuff surrounding her. Her Radiant Court Curse by Elizabeth Lim. A Deal with the Elf King by Elise Cover. And I know I've already mentioned it in a previous one, but Among Thieves by TJ Kuhn also has a map inside. And then set in our world, we have The Gravity of Us by Phil Stamper because the see here the rocket ship has smoke billowing out of it or steam or whatever it is the beckoning shadow by Catherine Blair she's got all this little wispy misty stuff surrounding her shiver by Junji Ito has got this kind of miasma fog cloud of smog type stuff on it one punch man by I actually don't know this one Yusuke Morata this one it has obviously when there's no smoke on it, 
uh, when there's no light on it. This one has smoke coming off his hand because he's just that powerful. The Raven Boys by Maggie Steve Arty. You can see all this wispy, smoky stuff. And finally, a psalm for the world built. It is the teeniest, tiniest little thing, but on the cup here, you can see the teeniest, tiniest little bit of steam coming off it. And then finally, for pathway four, this is a predominantly gray or white cover. And this one's probably the biggest category for this one that I've got, so I will just... So for grey, predominantly grey or white cover with a map inside, we have Six of Crows by Lee Bardugo. Full Metal Alchemist by Hiromu Arakara. This one doesn't have a map sort of on as you go in, but throughout the book it does show a map of the world and maps of the regions and highlights different areas like Ishval. Pretty sure Ed uses one pretty early on. Traitor's Blade, so the Great Coats by Sebastian de Castell has a map on the, just on the inside of the cover. A Dark Shade of Magic by V.E. Schwab, literally this is all mappage, so that counts even if the book itself doesn't have one inside. The Girl from the Other Side, this one has a map, as you read it, there is a map inside during one point when he's talking about the kingdom and the world. And then we have the Plated Prisoner series. I only have this one in physical format to show up, but the Plated Prisoner series by Raven Kennedy has a map in each of the books that you get. It has a map. And then the final one for with a map is, I'm going to talk about, is Daughter of the Pirate King by Trisha Levenseller because the whole story is about stealing a map. And then for set in our world and predominantly white or grey cover, by far the most books is in this one. We have A Blade So Black by L.L. McKinney, which is set in Georgia. The Once and Future Witches by Alex E. Harrow is set in Salem. The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue features France as well as America, New York, something like that. I'm not sure, but I definitely know it starts in France. The Florist by C.L. Patterson. I'm not sure where it is, but it, I think from the language it's set in England. The Switch by Beth O'Leary is set in Yorkshire and London. Natsume's Book of Friends is set in Japan. Black Butler is set in London. The Yakuza's Guide to Babysitting is set in Japan. I Think Our Son is Gay by Okura is set in Japan. Perfect World by Rie Eruga is set in Japan. As is The Master Cat is Depressed Again Today by Itsuzi Yamada. And Imakoi by Ayako Hata. And... <laughs> Days at the Morisaki Bookshop by Satoshi Yag Yagisawa. And finally, Watakoi Love is Hard for Otaku by Fujita. And then we also have Covenant by Lysandra Vuong, Gallant by V. E. Schwab, The Mindfuck series by S. T. Abbey, Salt and Broom, I don't remember the author name, so I'll put it up here, and My Lovesick Life as a 90s Otaku. Freaking sun's gone away. But the heat has remained. It sucks so bad. It's so muggy. For you guys, this is instantaneously later. For me, this is like a while. Took a quick break to um, most of the books that you just saw have had to go into the piles for the next bit. So I'm now very red in the face, very hot, very flustered. And the sun has now gone in, so all the light that I had, just, just, filming hates me right now. Has done for a few weeks, and I hate it. It's mutual, it's all great. These are the main house prompts, and we are starting off with the parlour, or the entryway, as it were. And this is a book with a sort of like a haunted, creepy house, or if you couldn't find it, then just a generic gothic book. So... Specifically for Haunted House, we have Gallant by V.E. Schwab, What Moves the Dead by T. Kingfisher, Sixteen Souls by Rosie Talbot, because a lot of places in here are haunted by ghosts. This Poison Heart by Kaylin Bayron isn't specifically a haunted house, but the house gives off really creepy vibes, and the atmosphere within the house and this setting is very creepy, so that's why I've counted it. Same with Trick or Treat, Point Horror, by Richie Tankersley Kusick. This is actually an original copy from the 90s, hence why it's so battered, beaten and bruised. But this one, the house is almost a character in this and has a lot of creepy stuff going on. And Belladonna by Adeline Grace. I'm not sure if this one does count or not, but from my research, I'm sure it does. And it seems like the house and the occupants are very kind of creepy. 
And then for generic sort of gothic, we have the uh, Ravina the Witch by Junko Mizuno, Girl from the Other Side by Nagabe, and Cursed and Anthology. We also have, in terms of like non fantasy, there's all sorts of horror type and gothic type books. We've got like Mexican Gothic, which has goth in the name. A lot of classics are considered to be gothic. So there's like Dracula, Frankenstein, Wuthering Heights is considered gothic. There's a lot of books out there that are considered to be gothic. So this one's very open to interpretation. Next up, we have one that just dropped on my foot and kind of hurt to be honest but hey ho, that's the sacrifice you make for these videos. Next up we had social gathering space. So these fe books feature places that have been created specifically for social gatherings like town halls, wedding venues, churches, things like that. And we have Legendborn by Tracy Dion that has two or three different places inside that have been built for the specific purpose of gathering of a secret society. All of Us Villains has a gathering space with um, in the town centre for the families of, that are cursed. A Murder of Saints features predominantly a church, it even has one on the cover. Gwen and I Are Not In Love is set in a palace and therefore it will have things like a ballroom and it also features a jousting tournament and what is a jousting tournament but a social gathering space? <laughs> Midnight's Twins by Holly Race, the main place that they gather and meet is a big castle and it does talk about it being a gathering room and a big sort of meeting hall. A Psalm for the Wild built by Becky Chambers, the tea monk's tent is a specific, when they set it up for receiving visitors, that is a specific gathering space. Watakoi, Love is Hard for Otaku, this one has a convention hall. Fence by C.S. Picat has a sports club, sports hall kind of thing. The Agency for Scandal by Laura Wood talks about ballrooms and talks about sort of opera houses and things like that and again it's all places where people gather. Cemetery Boys, not only do we have the church and the grounds, we also have the cemetery itself which is considered a gathering space for the Blue Whores and the Blue Hars. An Enchantment of Ravens by Margaret Rogerson features the Autumn Palace and talks about ballrooms and I think there is a ball at one point in there. I've got two that are kind of like the Viking longhouse, Jarl's houses, big central sort of town hall for Vikings if you are not familiar. We have Sky in the Deep by Adrienne Young and The Shadow of the Gods by John Gwynn. And then we have our Not So Lonely Planet Travel Guide which features multiple temples which again are considered social gathering spaces because people go there to pray, to meet, to talk, to marry, all of those kind of things. And then we also have Cinderella is Dead where there is a ballroom and the main, like the start of the story takes place in a ballroom where the prince is selecting his new Cinderella. Geekerella by Ashley Poston has a convention and is set in a big convention hall as is My Lovesick Life as a 90s Otaku. And then finally the Authenticity Project takes place at a cafe but the cafe does have a lot of social events and has is used as a social gathering space. The next pile is freaking huge. Next up is by far the biggest section and this is a book where a character learns something because this is so open to interpretation. It could literally be they learn something about their heritage, it could be that they've learned a new subject, a new skill, it could just be that they find out a secret, anything like that counts. So we have a lot to recommend for this one in particular. I won't say, ex if it's going to be a spoiler, I won't say what the, they learn, but I will just give you a very vague intonation. So once in future, family secrets. Death of a bookseller, learning about another person. Karen Marie moaning, learning about who they actually are, as well as learning how to fight and learning about the Fey world. Heartstopper is learning about your sexuality and Nick learning that he is bisexual. A man and his cat, a man and a cat learn to live together and the man learns how to look after a cat and the cat learns that he is not unwanted. Florist is the learning of a secret. The Plated Prisoner series is Oren learning that she is an absolute badass. Cat Plus Gamer, she's learning to look after a cat and how to take care of one. Slave to Sensation, lots of secrets that are unveiled throughout the entire series. Loveless is by Alice Oseman is another one about learning your sexuality. Need by Carrie Jones, you as a reader learn a lot about phobias because every chapter starts with a new phobia, but also the main character learns about her heritage. 
Guilty Pleasures by Laura K. Hamilton. It's a detective learning who killed somebody. Only a Monster by Vanessa Lent. Family Secrets. Cinder by Marissa Meyer. Family Secrets. <laughs> Fallen Kingdom by Morgan Rhodes says here... A sorceress discovers the truth about the supernatural legacy she is de destined to wield. Natsume's Book of Friends, Family Secrets. Fate Dates and Mooncakes is literally learning about recipes and le the characters learning how to make the mooncakes. Imakoi, learning what love is for the very first time. This Vicious Grace, learning about how to wield her power that has killed multiple people up until now. The Raven Boys, learning about pretty much everything. There is Family Secrets, there's... Um, learning about history, there's ley lines, there's ghosts, there's all sorts going on in this book and you learn multiple things. Horseman by Christina Henry, Family Secrets. Now She Is Witch, learning about sexuality and gaining power. Dark Rise by C.S. Bacat, Family Secrets, learning how to fight, all sorts in this. We have Chef's Kiss, which he's learning to be a chef. Covenant by Lysandra Vuong is again one with Family Secrets. Fruits Basket, learning about a powerful family curse. One Last Stop by Casey McQuiston is sort of learning about love and learning about the secrets of a person that Autumn, the main character, meets. And then finally, The Backup Plan by Jill Shalvis is a learning a lot about, and it was a bit of a misunderstanding, and they learn the truth about each other and realise it was a misunderstanding. Next up, we have Servants. So like I said, this can be the traditional version of Servants, sort of like a maid as butler things like that or it can be kind of like a modern day equivalent such as someone who works in a coffee shop where you are serving people that kind of thing for this one we have captive prince not only are there multiple servants mentioned but also the main character is kind of like a sex slave slash servant shanghai immortal by a y chow features multiple different servants as does girls of paper and fire where the girls themselves are kind of servants to they're more slaves, I would say, but they are called servants and they are servant to the emperor. Daughter of the Moon Goddess starts talking about servants and the uh, girl that was, she becomes a servant in order to sort of, you know, uncover what was going on with her family. Before the coffee gets cold, it's a coffee shop. She's a barista. She serves people. And so that is why I've gone with that. Nastal no, Cat is depressed again today. Yukichi is basically a servant. He, he cooks, he cleans goes shopping, he does everything for her. Mao has his own servant. Poison Study by Maria Snyder. She becomes the poison taste tester, which is a servant. Dark Shade Magic, there's multiple servants mentioned within the palace and also we look at the guards and the guards get a couple of scenes. Black Butler, speaks for itself. To Kill a Kingdom by Alexandra Christo has servants because Prince Elion, most of his crew are also servants of the castle. The Guild Hunter series, I've only got book two, I don't have book one right now because it went missing, but this one, multiple servants of the Archangel are mentioned and even on a couple of books become the main characters for those books. The Holiday Escape by Heidi Swain, they run a holiday cottage and so, you know, basically she is a sort of maid type thing. Spellslinger by Sebastian de Castell has, they have a house servant and a lot of the family secrets are linked within that kind of dynamic. Shadow of the Fox by Julie Kagawa. This has servants and the some of the characters have come from a serving background. And there's Sorcery of Thorns, Silas. Yeah, that's that category. Then we have single POV. So obviously this is just one person's perspective. We have Angel Fall by Susan E. Waking the Witch by Rachel Burge. Under Your Spell by Laura Wood. Ex Yakuza and Stray Kitten. The perspective is from the kitten itself. It's so cute. I only have the second book, but Fable series by Adrienne Young is a first person perspective from Fable. Strong Female Character by Fern Brady is an autobiography about being late diagnosed autistic. Love Me Do by Lindsay Kelk. First, PO first person romance. Gods of the Weirdwood is third person but focuses on one main character. The Wolf and the Woodsman by Ava Reed. A Blade So Black by L.L. McKinney. I Think Our Son is Gay by Okura is focusing from the POVs from the mother. Cersei by Madeline Miller is told from Cersei's perspective. One Punch Man focuses on Saitama. Traitor's Blade by Sebastian Castell is narrated the whole way through by Falcio Valmond. Zara, Guardian, Guardians of the Dawn, Zara by S.J. Jones is from Zara's POV. And that is that category, very quick to get through that one. 
Then we have mixed media slash audiobooks. So these are books that either feature mixed media or I recommend the audiobooks of. For mixed media, we have The Flat Share by Beth O'Leary with their How They Communicate via Post-it Notes, which is super cute, super wholesome. In the anniversary edition of Addie LaRue, we have pictures and we have like art throughout the book. Conventionally Yours by Annabeth Albert, throughout we get photographs posted and we get little Polaroids and snapshots like this one throughout the whole book. Dating Dr. Dill features texts and emails. How to End a Love Story by Yulin Kuang is also emails and texts and things like that. The Bromance Book Club, we get excerpts from the book that the club are reading. Caraval by Stephanie Garber, we get notes, we get clues, and we get different things throughout the book. Hate Mail is another one with emails and we get to see the emails. The 10,000 Doors of January, we get excerpts from the diaries that January finds. For mixed media, I will also point out that a lot of people assume that because manga is what it is with drawings, that that is automatically mixed media. I just wanted to clarify that manga is its own media. But if you get a manga and that manga includes, say, some recipes or it has page excerpts from a book that you're looking at, that would then still count, but manga in and of itself as a straight normal is not considered mixed media because it is its own media. I hope that makes sense and helps a little bit. Or maybe I've just kind of screwed it up for you and I apologise for that. But just wanted to clarify that not all manga is mixed media. So bear that in mind. And then for audiobook recommendations, we all know I recommend The Great Coats, always do. Another one by the same narrator is Boyfriend Material by Alexis Hall. This also does have mixed media in it because it has text messages. All three of the Brown Sisters books I highly recommend for audio. I prefer the first book myself before they change narrator, but a lot of people love all three and I did enjoy all three. I also recommend Starling House by Alex E. Harrow, that was really good. And the Raven Cycle series by Maggie Stiefvater I thought was absolutely incredible with the audiobook and Will Patton was exquisite. The next category is a parent main character or the main character is under 13. Some of these have got both. For example, My Brother's Husband by Gengaro Tagami has both. But parent MC, we have The Fifth Season by N.K. Jemisin. The Start of Something by Miranda Dixon has both. Wayward by Amelia Hart. Next of Kin by Hannah Bonham Young deals with foster care systems and a sister trying to adopt her sis her sibling. The Soulmate Equation by Christina Lauren. The Axis Guide to Babysitting, she is one of the main characters, she is under 13. As with Our Dining Table, it also features the father of the two boys. The Switch by Beth O'Leary, the main character one of the main characters is a grandmother, so she is a parent. <laughs> Spy Family, they might be faking it, but they are still parents. The Once and Future Witches by Alex E. Harrow. Alice by Christina Henry. Also by Christina Henry, Good Girls Don't Die. One of the main characters in this is a parent. I think two of them are. Delilah Green Doesn't Care. We have Claire is the parent and I think her daughter's under 13. Dragonbound by Thea Harrison does feature parents later on in the book. The Hate You Give by Angie Thomas. Eastside Hedwitch, her, the main character, is a mother and role playing by Kathy Yardley, the mother and her son have a pact about socialising and getting to talk to other people. And then finally, we have the Alchemy Lab, and this one was books with alchemy, chemistry, sort of any kind of sciencey thing. And I've also included a couple of sort of cheats in a way, but it might help you out. And the first of these is Cafe Con Lychee by Emery Lee. I'm considering this one a cheap because even though it's not specifically science, it is about cooking and they're fusing together two different cultures of food. Fusion is science. Yeah. Also Chef's Kiss because again it features cooking and it's got a lot of sort of recipes and things in. We have The Gravity of Us which features a lot of physics because it's set at NASA. Six of Crows, purely because of Wylan, he is pretty essential and he does deal with a lot of chemistry of the Boom Boom variety. Can't have alchemy and not talk about Full Metal Alchemist. Nimona has a lot of science and talks about scientific things. Infinity Alchemist by Case and Calendar is pretty much as you would expect, alchemy. Into the Crooked Place by Alexandra Cristo says that it has charms and potions, so I said potions would count. The Darkness Outside Us 
Bar Hi Elliot Schreffer features a lot of sort of science-y talk because it's set in space and it's to do with astronauts and physics. Sweat and Soap features a bit of chemistry not only between the main characters but also because he is a product creator of a soap company and she loves discussing soaps and things with him. We also have A Rose Among Thorns by Ash Fitzsimmons, I think, which is about potions and also about sort of putting together ingredients for potions. Cursed Cocktails, because cocktails are potions of an alcoholic variety. Not on the Plan by Dana Hawkins is set with in a coffee shop in Seattle, so coffee, again, you're kind of creating magic. And then Salt and Broom features witches and it talks about potions and potion making. That's all I've got for you for this video. I feel like I've got a lot of recommendations there and hopefully I've managed to get enough non-fantasy recs in each category as well so it gives you some ideas. Let me know in the comments if you have any suggestions of your own for any of the categories. Also don't forget if you are struggling you can either ask below or over on the Discord. Also after watching this if you do choose one of the books that I recommended please do let me know. It's always good to know when people have actually picked up the books that I recommend. And yeah I really hope that that was helpful. I hope that you're looking forward to the next round. I'm really excited. My TBR is ready. I just need the next couple of weeks to go so I can get to it. I'm really in a sort of dark fantasy horror sort of moody atmospheric reads at the moment so I'm really excited to get to my books because most of them fit into that category and yeah I'm excited so let me know if you are joining let me know if you've got any few further recommendations or if you've picked up any of the books that I've recommended I hope you're all good I hope you're staying safe don't forget to get onto the discord so that you get all of the updates that are available and take part in the chats I hope you're all good I hope you're staying safe and until next time bye